Hey everybody, I had a subscriber ask about uh, different types of rail <clears throat> and uh, got me thinking uh, there are a lot of different types of rail. Different types, different sizes, they use for different functions, uh, everything from uh, running in little carts and mines to trains to uh, burying them in the ground to keep people from running into things. Uh, the Transcontinental Railroad was originally laid with 60 pound rail, and that is very small rail. Uh, all this rail you see behind me is anywhere between 119 and 136 pound rail. I'm in the Bakersfield yard right now. Uh, this is where they have a bunch of rail stored. Uh, use it to fix broken rails and defective rails and stuff. They keep a good supply of it on hand. But uh, rail goes, uh, Heck, they make rail all the way down to probably seven or eight pound rail for the live steam trains, the little small six scale trains and stuff, uh, even smaller than that. But uh, 136 is the biggest rail that I've ever worked with. I understand there's 141, I think, is the uh, size of rail, but I've never worked around that. But uh, the, when I came to work here, most of the main line was 115 and 119 pound rail. And when I say uh, 115, 119, whatever pound rail, that is the weight of three feet of rail. Uh, rail is dated. It has uh, forged into it the date that it was made. Uh, old rail is just the year. Uh, modern rail even has the, the little hash marks on it for the month it was made. That way uh, we can keep track of how old the rail is. People have asked me how long rail lasts. Well, that depends. If it's in real curvy territory, like up on the Tehachapi, uh, it doesn't last that long. It gets worn out pretty quickly. I did a piece on curve oilers, which I'll link in the description below, that uh, help keep the rail from wearing out too quickly. But it still doesn't last as long, say, as on what they call tangent track, which is straight track. It could last many, many, many years on straight track. And they have huge system gangs that come through and change rail when it needs to be changed as far as a lot of rail. Back when I first went to work in Tehachapi, I was on a signal gang up there, a small uh, two-man signal gang. We followed a gang that was headquartered in Tehachapi and every day they went out and transposed rail. Transposing meant that they would uh, take it from one side, pull it off, move it over, take the other side off, move it to the other side, and then stick the other side, it would just swap it side for side. Uh, it would wear out to a kind of a cone shape before it was all said and done. But once they've transposed it, the next time they have to actually change it. But uh, anyway, let's uh, get going and see if we can't go find some different sizes of rail, some angle bars, insulated joints, and other associated things going along with the rail. All right, let's go. Okay, I didn't uh, see one of these out at Famosa, so thought I'd get a shot of one here in the storage yard. This is what the modern insulated joint looks like. Uh, this is, I just said earlier that uh, we don't have work with 141 pound rail, but by golly, that is 141 pound rail, so I guess they're using it around here. So this is called an I-bond. Um, it has an insulated joint already built into a piece of rail that they uh, take this out in the field just like it is. They cut the rail out in the field and uh, weld this in. And the insulated joints don't come apart. They're like this from the factory. Uh, they're very good. They're solid. They last a long time. And we don't generally have problems with them. So anyway, that is the modern insulated joint. Before we head out in the field to try to find some different types of rail, we'll go over a couple of things here. These are angle bars. I'll show you those, uh, how they all hook up when we get out in the field. And uh, those are what they use to bolt pieces of rail together. Angle bars. These are the older style tie plates. They still use them everywhere, but they are using different kinds depending on the rail. These are the spike type. If you're still spiking rail, they lay these plates on the tie. They lay the rail in this groove right here. They spike the tie to the plate, and then they uh, put the spikes in these holes right here. The head of the spike goes against the rail and holds the 
plate to the tie and the rail to the plate. And these are plates that are used at switches. You can see these longer ones here. Switches, frogs, uh, they go, they have uh, special ties they use there for switch, the switch ties and that stuff all bolts up to the tie. I will uh, link in the description below the piece I did on how switches work and you will see uh, where those ties are in relation to the rail. These plates here are for, they use these on the concrete ties, uh, you can use them on wooden ties too, but uh, on the uh, concrete ties they put those down, the rail goes in this groove here, and then they have special clips, and I don't see any of those clips around here, but uh, they're curly Q looking little clips, and they, uh, they uh, use those to hold the rail to the plate rather than using spikes. These, right here, are called anti-creepers. We just we just call them creepers around here, and uh, they would take. Well, let me grab one and kind of show you. They would take these, stick them on the rail like that, up against a tie, and hammer those on with a sledgehammer on each side of the tie. It helps to keep the rail from running, they do that all the ties, and it helps to keep the tie itself from moving under the rail. Again, those are called creepers. And we're still in the yard here. This is where they have some uh, wheels stored here. And, uh, Bakersville Yard. And that is how a tie plate works. You can see it sits on the tie, rail sits in the plate. Everything spiked to the rail. The reason I'm showing you most of this stuff, or as much as I can in the yard, is so when I go out in the field, I won't have to foul any main lines, and uh, won't have to foul any tracks I don't need to. All right, moving on. These right here come down to a narrow little point. These are switch points. These are the pieces of the rail that move at a switch. And they are hooked together with switch rods. Again, when I link that uh, switch piece, you can see how that works. And uh, these are the switch points. All right, this is a frog. This is at a switch where one rail crosses the other. They use these. This is actually a spring frog here. But uh, these are used so they can cross the rail over each other without derailing a train. They're called frogs because anybody who has uh, been around horses and such knows what the bottom of a horse's hoof looks like. It's got that little point like that in it, and it's called a frog. And that is where these things got their names. A frog. A few frogs. All right, okay, um, this is 80 pound rail. This is the smallest rail that I've seen in service on the railroad since I've worked here. Uh, like I said, I, I know there are smaller sizes, but uh, not in use on the railroad. Uh, as a matter of fact, this is the only place I've ever even seen 80 pound rail. Small rail is generally 90 pound but this is 80. Uh, these are angle bars right here where the pieces of rail come together. These are the joints that uh, bolt the rail together. Uh, obviously holes through the j bars and holes through the rail and I don't know if you can see it or not. I don't know if it'll come out or not but you can see the 80 down there between the uh, two bolts. That signifies this is an 80 pound joint which is 80 pound rail. I don't know if this will come out. It says 8004, Illinois Steel Company, South Works, 1905. So this rail was made in 1905. Come right up here and we have an insulated joint. Uh, this is a fiber type bar. These are old, they don't make these anymore. They're, and now they're a plastic encased steel. Uh, 
even for rail this small. But insulated joints are non, made of non-conductive material that is used to stop track circuits. In this case, that's dead track out there. It has uh, no circuitry on it. This is the uh, crossing circuit for Famosa Road. Uh, once the train comes on this side of the insulated joints, the gates will drop. I will put a link in the description below of how railroad crossings work to explain how that all works. Okay, up here we have, this is called a comp joint. This is a joint that is used when two different rail sizes are joined together. In this case, this joint is an 80 to 113 pound rail, but this piece of rail here is actually 119 pound, but the joints will work. Uh, they don't take a lot of beating out here. Don't need to support a lot of uh, weight with the trains going on. And this 119 pound rail was made according to the uh, dates in 1970. Then we have another comp joint here from 119 to 136 pound. And as I said at the beginning, 136 pounds, prevalent uh, rail being used on the main lines. And uh, these pieces of uh, 136 pound were made in 2005. All right, let's move over here. We've got some head free rail over here. Okay, we have another comp joint here. 119 to 136 pound rail and if you look closely <clears throat> you'll see that these are two different types of rail the type on the right is the T head rail one that's shaped like a T and the one on the left is head free rail you can see how it bevels in towards the bottom I've never I hated working with this kind of rail when we were bonding it. It was a real pain in the butt. We had special molds that we used to put on uh, the railhead bonds, which is that right there is a railhead bond. That piece of wire welded to each piece of the rail. That is for continuity in the track circuit. And uh, it was a uh, you had special molds that were angled up to to use, and it could be a real pain in the butt. Uh, another thing you see here is behind the joint, you see another wire that's welded to the rail. It goes behind the joint over to there. These uh, are shunt fouling circuits, which means that uh, they don't have a relay that controls this circuit individually. So it's tied into the uh, main line. And they have to be double bonded. And the uh, wire behind the joint is... Uh, it's hard to knock that off. Railhead bonds get knocked off during a track work sometimes. But anyway, uh, that is a railhead bond on a comp joint from T-head to head-free rail. I've never uh, had anyone be able to explain to me why head-free rail was made. I, I really don't know. That's, like I said, it's kind of a pain to work with. It's not very prevalent anymore. You don't, I haven't seen it on the main line in years. This is the newer type of insulated joint here. You can see how it's uh, got the greenish color, plastic around a steel bar. The holes that are drilled through it have uh, insulated bushings to keep anything from touching. And that stops the track circuit, just like over on the other side. This is all dead track back here. All right. Oh, that signal up there. Just turned green, so that means he has a train cleared through here. So I am going to get out of here before he shows up, traps me on the other side of the tracks from my truck. Uh, you know, I figured I'd kill two birds with one stone. I had a subscriber a while back asked me about the wires that are plugged into the tracks and uh, like this here you see that wire plugged in there so plugged in it's welded we used to actually plug these in we would drill a hole in the rail drive a little sleeve through with a hammer stick the wire in it and then drive a pin with a half round cut out over the top of the wire and bang that in there and that's how we did track wires we stopped doing that a long time ago see right there that is what that looked like. That's a pin in the sleeve with the wire sticking out of it. It's not hooked up to anything anymore. This is all welded. 
But anyway, those are called track wires. And they are connected to that case, the second to bigger case there in this case. Uh, and uh, they are, they go to a relay in there, the track relay. And when that track is shunted by a train, or should there be a piece of wire or pipe get across it or a broken rail, it would uh, short the circuit in the case of a piece of wire, a pipe, or a train. It would open the circuit in the case of broken rail. That track circuit would then drop out. Uh, this would be the battery end of the circuit, and it would feed across the street to the set of wires that are over there. They're buried underground. They also come into this case. You have a battery end and a relay end. Uh, or uh, transmit and receive if you're talking about some of our electronics but uh, anyway and uh, another thing I'd like everybody knows I am uh, keeping myself safe by using ITD individual train detection I'll put a link in the description below uh, to the video I made of how railroad workers protect themselves when they're out on the tracks now that uh, signal there is clear so I know there's a train coming from that direction I'll be going that way and uh, gonna stay away from the main line I look down there I don't see a don't see any trains coming but right here that wire there and the, that wire there those are shunt wires those are connected to a shunt and uh, that is explained in the video that I'll link of how crossings work. But, but uh, those wires are connected to a shunt that is buried under the tracks. And uh, that sends a frequency out that way. And on the other side of the crossing is another shunt wire that sends the frequency out that way to activate the uh, electronic crossing controllers in the case. All right. Well, when I got home and started editing the video last night i realized i left out two key components of rail and that is jointed rail and what is called continuously welded rail or ribbon rail uh, jointed rail is sections of rail that have joints uh, back in the old days when it first started joints were 39 feet long and eventually they started welding those together at the factory and they became 78 foot pieces of rail. And when I was working with the rail gang that transposed rail, that's generally what we worked with was uh, 78 foot jointed rail. But uh, jointed rail on the main line is pretty much a thing of the past. We still have joints on main line because you still have broken rails or rail defects where they have to go change rails and they can't get right to it to weld it back in. But the preference is to always have mainline rail welded out. They have a factory that welds the rail together. And that's all it is. It's, a, it's the same thing. They don't make ribbon rail that's quarter of a mile long. It's made in 78 foot sections or whatever sections it's made in. Then it's welded at a facility, put on a special train. Perhaps you've seen those trains that are loaded with rail. That's a ribbon rail train. And that rail is distributed wherever they need it or picked back up after uh, a ribbon rail project. But uh, anyway, there you go with jointed rail and ribbon rail. All right. Well, that will conclude my piece on rail and uh, the different types and sizes, etc. And... Uh, if there's something that I missed that any of you rail experts, you track guys, uh, might want to add, leave that in the comments below. And uh, if you have any ideas, as usual, any things you'd like me to look into, um, obviously I will do that if I'm able. So uh, remember to like, share, and subscribe. Click on the bell if you want to be notified of future content. And hey, We'll see y'all later.